Please welcome your panelists for The Business of Aging, Capitalizing on the Demographic Shift, moderated by senior partner and global leader for Mercer's multinational client group, Pat Milligan. Good morning, and, and thank you all for joining us and, and getting up, uh, I guess, on the last day quite, quite early to, 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 to be part of a topic that um, we think is actually holds a lot of potential. Um, we're here to talk about both the economic and social impact of an older workforce. And for any of you that, how many of you were able to join Paul Irving's panel yesterday um, and get more optimistic about living to 100? So um, that was amazing. And so I think we all walked away saying, we're going to live to 100 and we're going to thrive. And I think the real question is, are we actually going to be able to integrate great work into that longevity life. So our conversation today is really around what are the challenges and what are the obstacles um, to, to actually living and working as long as you want and are able. Um, so um, I'm gonna introduce our panelists as we start the conversation. To my far left um, is Scott Frisch. He's the COO and head of operations for AARP. Um, and I think, Scott, if any organization is on the pulse of how do members and, and um, employees and retirees feel about this issue. It's AARP, you know, 37.8 million members strong. Um, you had some great comments yesterday about what are the opportunities and the challenges of really embracing older workers. And um, I think we'll start with some of the challenges because there are a lot of obstacles. So right. how about if you get us started? Well, thanks for the plug too, 38 million members. Absolutely. Uh, you know, what we, what we were discussing yesterday was that there are myths out there about the older worker. Um, and I think it all is encapsulated around the concept of ageism. But people believe that if you're older, you're, you know, you're gonna cost more uh, to hire, you're gonna be, uh, it's more expensive to retain you, you're not up on technology, you have trouble relating to younger generations, um, your work ethic isn't as, as strong as it used to be. And these, you know, these are just some of many, and we can go on for this for a while, but these, these myths really perpetuate this concept of age discrimination in the workforce. Um, and it's, a, it's definitely a challenge. And people want to work longer either because they like to work or they have to work financially. And it creates a, a, an interesting dynamic for uh, organizations and enterprises on how to balance having a diverse workforce, which includes an older worker. So maybe we can build on what we really know and what we don't know about, about in keeping older workers in the workforce. Uh, I'll just cite a Mercer study that we recently did with 100 of our clients representing about 15 million workers, and less than 25% of those organizations had a workforce strategy or a workforce plan that had any specifics about the desire to keep or retain older workers, which workers with what capabilities in what locations um, globally, and regardless of whether they were hitting a talent shortage in Germany, the UK, the US, Canada, they were devoid of a workforce strategy about older workers. Incredibly focused on millennials, but not focused on older workers. And I wanted to turn to Laura Carstensen, um, the dis a distinguished professor of psychology um, at Stanford, um, but the director of the Stanford Longevity Center. And Laura, in our work together, one of the things we've really explored is how do we begin to really assess the, the real performance of older workers mm -hmm. to begin to break down some of the myths, Scott, that you talked about. So I thought you could share you know, your, your learnings and your insights on why are we not really studying that cohort the way we are fixated on studying Millennials, so love to hear your perspective on this. Yeah, sure. Um, I think myths, in, in part, so dominate our views of older workers that people feel like they don't need to study it. Or we just kind of know, you know, what 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 older people are like. Uh, but there are some problems in how we assess workers, and a lot of performance evaluations occur when a manager sits down across from uh, an individual and they look at that person and they say, you're doing a great job or not a great job or something like this. So it's, it's filled with an opportunity to have um, uh, con preconceptions about what that person's like. And so if you look at individual performance ratings, you often see poor performance ratings for older people than younger people. Hagen Albanchin, your colleague, uh, labor economist at Mercer, has done, I think, the most interesting work on this, where he has looked not just at individual evaluations, 
but at the productivity of particular units within companies as a function of the number of older people who participate in that unit. And if you look at those findings, they're quite distinct from the individual ratings. And in those findings, you often find that the presence of older workers in teams, in a, in, in a department, uh, in an organization, increases the productivity of that unit. And this has just been completely missed, I think, in most of our research and understanding of aging. So maybe we'll, we'll, we'll come back and talk, we'll you know, dig a little more deeply into you know, how do we actually bu build that business case. But it, you know, one of the things we talked about yesterday was this notion of a movement, right? We need a movement to actually champion the value and role of older workers. To my left is um, Baroness um, Camilla Cavendish. And your know, background, Camilla, is so fascinating if you think about you know, what you've done as the head of policy um, under Prime Minister David Cameron. And you know, you've been able to actually influence things like big sugar, right? And so now you're absolutely putting that energy into demographic and aging. Not a lot like a logical transition in my mind, but I think that, um, <laughs> that you were really passionate yesterday about how do you start to create that movement mm -hmm. and why, mm -hmm. why your involvement now? And what do you think? And what are you doing at Harvard to, to help okay. on that? Okay, so so I'm a senior fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School at the moment, um, and I'm looking at some of this. I'm, I'm and I'm coming at this uh, sort of slightly as an outsider, I suppose. And there is a connection with sugar. I was the author of the sugar tax on fizzy drinks that just came into force in the UK, um, which was a very small step towards trying to um, tackle obesity. Um, I think there is a connection because what we're seeing is the most extraordinary divergence in life expectancy. So we now have a situation in the developed world where if you are somebody basically in this room or this conference, you probably are going to live 13 years longer than somebody who's out, out there driving a car. Mm -hmm. And it, the correlation with education and the correlation with income is really stark. That I think we have to tackle, but something else is going on, which is a healthy life expectancy also is not growing as fast as life expectancy. So we're going to have all these extra years. What are we going to do with them? We want to be as productive as we can, but we are seeing more and more people with chronic diseases, diabetes, dementia, asthma, and I think that's where there is a connection. We, we, have, to, we have to tackle some of that. But just to your, your point about the movement, I mean, I suppose when I look at Europe, and really the, the situation is very similar, but actually you're ahead of us in the States because what you've got is a lot of older workers just saying, yeah, you know, I want to go on working. The employment rate of older workers has zoomed ahead in this country since the financial crisis. That's partly for financial reasons, but it's also because older people are saying, you know what, I, can, I have something to contribute. And in Europe, we're seeing something similar, but at a much lower level. So we have, people are still retiring incredibly early. And that's an issue, big issue for governments. But if we're going to make people work really, we've got to give them the opportunities. But also, we've we've got to improve health. So we're, we've got to improve health and well-being. And so I'm going to turn to Kirsten Alexson, um, the vice president of strategy and new business assessment at Pfizer. And I can't think of an organization that's been more focused on the health issues of older workers and seniors. And yesterday, Kirsten, you were really passionate, again, a lot of passion about this topic, um, about trying to shift from a culture of paying for, for, for cr chronic diseases and the things that go wrong and incenting organizations to focus much more on well-being. Um, and, and you also talked a lot about the uniqueness of the situation we're all in, um, but not forgetting the people who aren't going to be able to work. So, mm -hmm. let, let's go. Let's go outside to the to the health space and, and let you give us some insights on uh, on how we might think about that. Wonderful. Thank you, and thank you all for coming to the panel and for uh, allowing me to be a part of the discussion today. So, uh, while there have been tremendous uh, declines in mortality from heart disease, it is still the number one cause of mortality in this country. Um, second is cancer. Um, and when I look at what medicine has been able to do um, in terms of reducing uh, mortality, medicines are responsible for about two-thirds. Um, and I, I think you can get a pretty clear understanding of how the industry works when we, when we look at cardiovascular disease. There are right now in this country 30 million people taking a generic form of atorvastatin or amlodipine, which is Lipitor and Norvasc. And those are just the Pfizer uh, generics. Those are medicines that were developed decades ago, uh, had a time when they were on patent, they, um, 
part of the marketing efforts of Pfizer and other companies was to increase the screening, the uh, testing for high cholesterol, the management of blood pressure. Now those medicines are very, very inexpensive. They're still broadly used, but we still have a problem with adherence to treatment. Um, you know, for a number of reasons. It's not, cost is a factor, but these aren't high cost medicines. We still have to be addressing the other determinants of people being able to do what they need to do for their bodies, whether it's a ride to the doctor, knowing why their medicine, knowing if their medicine is working, having accurate expectations around the side effects what, that they might be experiencing, whether they're medication related or not. Um, and then, you know, apart from that is all the other social things that we know are significant predictors of your healthcare cost. People who are engaged in their healthcare cost 8% less and actually 21% less as they go on in time. So it's not just a nice to have, but having a social community, a support system, um, a connection to your care makes you feel good. It actually makes you cost less. Mm -hmm. Then on the flip side, we look at osteoarthritis, the number one cause of disability in this country. Um, there are some treatments available. We would, there's no cure for osteoarthritis. Um, but then we look at sort of the insurance structures that are there for osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis. And too often, people are being asked to pay more for the medicine that is appropriate for their condition than something that is inexpensive and ineffective, like an opioid or like something that's of lesser value. So I think we need to not only be aligning and supporting people with the behavioral um, and, and social support that they need, but also making sure that the financial incentives are aligned so that they're encouraged to use the right treatment for their disease and avoid uh, more complications down the road. So just let, let's maybe broaden it a, a little bit to what, what do you see great organizations doing to take all those insights and that data, but create an environment where all five generations can actually thrive and live in a climate of well-being at work? And then hopefully, Laura, you can build on that because one of the disconnects is from the data you just discussed is how difficult it is for organizations like Mercer to help build business cases for well-being. You know, very few CEOs, when you get them alone, still believe that this is an investment that I need to make. And they certainly have bi biases about, should I be making this investment in older workers? So mm -hmm. maybe talk a little bit about the well-being. And then, Laura, you know, you've, you're very passionate about that part of this conversation. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think part of it is setting up a benefit structure so that your employees have, um, have affordable access to care. We are seeing too many high-deductible health plans where people are being asked to pay four or $5,000, which maybe for the people in this room, you can save up and plan for that, but the majority of people in this country do not have savings. And those are the workers who need the well-being and the wellness more than anybody else. Um, and so, you know, there's things like on-site care, making sure people have transportation to the doctor. I know a number of health insurance companies have put in plans um, to, to allow people to have transportation to the doctor. It's something that Pfizer has offered through support systems. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really putting yourself in the position of that person you want to be well and saying, what are their financial constraints? What are their transport constraints? What are their emotional constraints? And addressing those. And it's very hard to see the near term payoff there. So it's, I think it's a long term investment, but hopefully researchers like Laura and others can, can demonstrate that that is a net benefit. So I think, Laura, because one of the biases is that older workers in the workplace cost more from a health perspective. So I want you to share your views on um, what part of that is a myth and then also um, what, what's our perspective on what we can do about that. Mm -hmm. uh, older workers generally do cost more uh, for uh, reasons related to health insurance. And uh, those are solvable problems. And I think we need to set aside those and separate them from uh, perceived problems with older workers that are more behavioral. Uh, but those are, those are problems that we do need, need to, to solve, and there are policy changes that could make that possible, like allowing older workers uh, to uh, use Medicare as a primary health insurer as opposed to the company, which now is taking on those, those costs. Uh, so there are some solutions to it, and, and we need to, to pursue them. If I may just sure, pick absolutely. up on the, the, the workplace, uh, there is good reason to think that this uh, 13 to 15 year difference in life expectancy as a function of zip code in this country, for mm -hmm. example, mm -hmm. comes about because of work. Um, that the workplace is where we spend an, an inordinate amount of our time, our waking hours, most of us in this country. And if you work in a, an, in a workplace where you're exposed to toxins, where you don't have 
control over your hours, where you're you know, working shift work, and uh, you're under a lot of stress, or you are more likely to have accidents, those are the, it looks like that accounts for much of this difference in life expectancy. So workplace represents a, a, a fabulous opportunity to go in and improve uh, the health of people over the long term. Uh, I think employers who decide that they're going to get into that game are going to stand to benefit a lot using that as an employee benefit um, and being able to recruit high quality workers to environments that are healthy. Pat, so, could I just please, say something absolutely. about, um, I've, I've talked to a number of companies in Europe about this and, and some of them are, you know, some of them are taking this very seriously and the ones that are are doing it because their customers are getting older. Right. So, <laughs> and they're actually experiencing the fact that sometimes, you know, the older guy is better on the phone. Um, I was talking to an insurance company recently and, you know, they're dealing with a lot of claims at the end of life, very difficult conversations. And they've hired a couple of guys who are over 60 who, lo and behold, um, have quite a lot to teach the younger people about how to have that conversation. And I think that's very striking. And I think those companies are offering flexibility. So fundamentally, those ones are, are having talked to the older people about what they want and how they can keep them in the workforce. They're finding they've got caring responsibilities. Mm -hmm. They really do need to have a much more flexible schedule. And they're offering that, but they still see that they're getting the benefit. And actually, I think that's what millennials increasingly want too. Yeah. So you know, all of us who are employing people are seeing that more and more people want flexible work. So maybe that's part of the answer to this. And maybe that's, that's actually an intergenerational issue. So I was going to add, um, getting back to the comment about benefits, and I'm sure I don't have a, a data point to support this, but although I'm sure Mercer has it somewhere. Um, but what we hear is that although utilization rates for on-site health facilities um, or fitness centers on-site and at the in place of employment, their utilization rates clearly don't justify the cost. However, it's become table stakes in that if you don't have it, you're less attractive as an employer to staff. And I think that isn't just an issue for older workers. I, 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 and what we try to do is we look, try to look at benefits in terms of not age, but in terms of life stage. Because let's take caregiving as an example. We just launched uh, 18 months ago a caregiving leave policy where every staff gets up to 80 hours a year paid for care, caregiving. Um, and it's been the most incredible benefit the staff has, has uh, talked about. But the utilization of it is, ju is just the same for an older worker as it is for someone in their 20s or 30s with young children. So um, I think if you think about life stage, phased in retirement is another example, right? It may be good for someone who's 52 who wants to or 50 or 60 or 65, it doesn't matter. Um, but you have to balance the cost, but you have to balance the ability to attract employees at any age. And thinking of uh, benefits in terms of life stage as opposed to one um, demographic versus another is just an added um, advantage for employers. So, Bill, just talking a little bit about the situation in the UK, right? If you look at, you know, the lack of true worker replacement ratios, what are we going to do to actually continue to grow the economy given the, the aging of the workforce, very similar, obviously, in Germany and Japan? One of the things I'd love you to talk about is why is the study of when w workers actually want to retire what they would trade in terms of flexibility and different kinds of work arrangements. There's very little strategic review of, of asking those older workers yeah. exactly what they want to be doing and then redesigning the work to actually fit that value proposition. So let's kind of hear, what do you think you need to do in the UK to actually make that, start to make that a reality? So, brilliant question. I'm not sure I've got the answer, but um, the British government has, has done quite a bit of work on this, and they calculated that if we could get everyone to work for one extra year, we would add 1% to yeah. GDP. Now, that's a, you know, it's a headline figure, but I mean, it's actually quite profound in some ways. Um, we know that we are facing, just as you're facing here, uh, a burden on our pension and health care entitlements that is 
unsustainable. Um, we have a, you know, we, we have a different healthcare system, but you know what? I mean, the underlying drivers are the same. Um, in terms of what we can do, I mean, we have, there have been a number of studies, Pat, which you know, which have tried to ask people, right. what would you trade? You know, so in some cases, people will say, you know what? I'd trade, I'd keep, I'd stay in the job if I had more flexibility. In some cases, they say, I'm, I'm willing to take a pay cut. They don't always say that. So I think there's a whole new conversation we have to have about this. And I think this is not, the onus here is not just on employers, to be honest with you. I mean, I think we all have to think about ourselves as well and what we're offering. I mean, most of us in this room have employed people, and I'm not sure most of us in this, I'm sure we've all had the experience of someone coming in and going, well, what are you doing for me? You know, and actually that's not, <laughs> that one-way conversation, I think, is not going to solve this. So I think we also have to, have to try and engineer a conversation about, as you said, what do people want? There are studies that suggest that older people would like more of a mentoring role, you know, maybe the ratchet of seniority is not endless. You know, maybe there is a point in your life where you say, look, I'm willing to step to one side and have a slightly different role. Um, but it has to be a two-way conversation. Mm -hmm. that makes totally sense. agree. Is somebody's mic not on? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, I, everything I've just said. Is really <laughs> 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 did you hear her or no? Yeah. You did? Okay. I'm not quite sure. Um, so, so we... <laughs> One of the things, Kirsten, we talked about yesterday is that we come to this conversation with our own biases, right? Which is, you know, we're healthy. We, um, we believe as we age that we're still capable of learning, of using technology, um, of doing all of the things that make you a vibrant worker who employers want. But you, you made a really strong point that there's a very significant part of the population that is not going to be able to actually um, engage in work that way, and that we can't forget about that part of the population. So just uh, that perspective, I think, would be very helpful. Yeah, I, mean, I think I've heard on a number of panels, you know, well, if we just ate right and exercised, this, we'd be fine. You know, and we'd all be back at work, and then we could retrain. We could retrain into higher skilled jobs, and, and then we're really going to be fine. Well, there's just so many people for whom that's not even an option, right? They, they don't have neighborhoods where they can exercise or access to food and their caregivers, and we've talked a lot about uh, older Americans continuing to work. I mean, so many older Americans take care of their grandchildren, take care of their spouses, take care of their parents, take care of their sisters, aunts, and uncles, and, and none of that really has been valued, and I think that's part of why we haven't actually seen the investment in prevention um, sort of as demanded by uh, our country, because a lot of that work is just, we don't count it, right? It doesn't count in the GDP, we don't consider right. it a value. Um, I think if we started really considering that a value, uh, we would be investing more and in making sure that our seniors get, or, well, even not even just our seniors, but throughout your life, that you're getting your vaccines, you're getting your necessary preventive care, you're getting that ride to the doctor. Um, and so, yeah, when we have these conversations, I just hope that we can consider beyond sort of the group that's sitting here that doesn't have an income constraint, that isn't thinking about how much bus fare is going to be and do you have enough uh, trips? Because for them, when they arrive at the doctor's office or... Uh, the pharmacy, and there's a copay of 40 or $50, it's really, it's an impossibility. It's not just that it's going to hurt, it's an impossibility. So one of, one of the conversations, you know, we've had over the last several days is the, and, and the focus at Milken this year on gender, right? So, so very strong commitment to, to the, as I call it, the gender movement. And, and, and I'm being personally involved when women thrive at Mercer and, and globally at the World Economic Forum. Watching that movement and watching the focus has um, been pretty remarkable. And one of the questions I have is why are we not able to create the same level of energy and commitment around aging workforces? Because as a group, they're nowhere near as studied. Um, we rarely do focus groups. One of my pet peeves is there, it is the only employee group that doesn't have an affinity group. So if you look across companies worldwide, you have an affinity group for everything. Um, a big lobby for me in New York now is an affinity group for pet walkers. You know, so like every aspect of life has an affinity group, but, but older workers do not congregate. They don't have a business or employee resource group. And I think it gets back, Scott, to I mean, the, starting with just the personal biases of affiliating with that group. Right. So I'm more than willing to show up regularly for every woman's group and every activity and every march, but I haven't in any way, as one of the more senior older women at Mercer, championed 
the role of older workers. So why not? Why? I mean, I don't need a. It's not a psychology session, but maybe Laura can help me. But um, but I do think that first and foremost, it it is this notion that we don't want to admit that that's me, right? So so somehow that's one affinity group that has with it a lot of psychological baggage, right? So Laura shaking. But let's talk about. Let's unpack that a little because I do think how do we make it safe? At work to actually have those conversations, yeah. um, and you know, and love to hear you both, because I think if we—that's a big elephant, right? If we don't actually get behind the emotional and psychological part of that conversation, I, I don't think we'll help that population move forward. So yeah, I, I, I don't have the. If I had that answer, it would be a you know different <laughs> world. But I, let me let me defer to Laura to start <laughs> on the psychology of it, and and maybe I'll offer some comments. All right, all right. I I, I, can, I think you're right. You're you're um, onto this. N people who are healthy and functioning well do not consider themselves right. old. Right. So when you ask people how old old people are, they generally say whatever age their parents are, <laughs> but they don't consider themselves old. And there's not a term that is acceptable right. in our culture. Old, elderly, senior. People hate all of those. <laughs> um, I published an op-ed in the Washington Post this fall uh, recommending perennials as a as a uh, a term we could use uh, to refer to ourselves as we get older, a 2,000 really vitriolic responses to those <laughs> folks. You know, people are saying, "Don't call me an effing flower." I mean, whatever. You know, I mean, <laughs> but but there isn't a term. And as long as we refer to older people as they in the third person, we will have negative views of old people until because if it's you've got to be sick and impaired before you're gonna call yourself old or someone else old. We're never gonna call healthy people old, and so we're gonna to continue to have this kind of term. But that's why I think people aren't gonna show up for an affinity group uh, for old people, uh, because we're not old. We. I <laughs> so, I, I, so first of all, everyone can join AARP. That'll start, that'll help. Um, and we have 38 million of us, but um, I think and we saw this a little bit yesterday when we were chatting uh, with a smaller group, is when people think of the older person or the older worker, for whatever reason, whether it's society, whether it's the media that causes it, or whatever reason, people immediately go to the very old and sick mm -hmm. and um, individual, as opposed to thinking, when I was 18, I thought my father at whatever, I guess he'd be 45, was old. And so your, your perception of old changes as you get older. But for whatever reason, people immediately go to the, the extremes, um, and they lose sight of the fact that, you know, at, and at my age, I'm much better at what I do today had I had the job 20 years ago. Uh, I think we all are, right? I think everybody in this room is. So. I, I, there is a psychology, and I'm not a psychologist, obviously, but I think there is a psychology to the concept of people thinking old as sick and frail, which is not true. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there was some study that I read that 75% uh, of the people, um, 75 to 84, don't have a single disability, whether it's medical, physical, et cetera. It's, people don't think about that. Mm -hmm. Well, I think you know, just to build on that, I think the other you know conversation, Laura, you and I, ha you and I have had is that you know there is there is also on a on the world country by country, you know, legal limits to what kind of conversations you can have with people mm -hmm. to actually help them prepare. And we like this phrase, next age, next stage. Mm -hmm. So I mean, I'm you know, as I think about my next age, I'm thinking about my next stage. But I actually think if we can create an, a legal environment where particularly within the kind of corporations that we all work, you know, we work for, you know, that you can actually begin to have, just have a basic conversation. What is your plan, right? What is your life plan? What would you like to be doing? What would you like to be doing more of? Um, and it, we, and again, we survey everything. We did, you know, the survey and it was, you know, the, that question was owned by the general counsel in the corporation. What were you allowed to ask? When were you allowed to ask it? And when were you getting into mm -hmm. any slippery slope on age discrimination? So one very tangible thing we're working on is how do you actually begin mm -hmm. to create an environment where those conversations are safe? Mm -hmm. um, and then also, how do you begin to actually assess what are the competencies that older workers have 
that actually should be woven into um, the work environment, whether it's an ability to mitigate safety risk, whether it's actually the performance on teams from a coaching um, perspective. So maybe, again, I mean, I think, Laura, you and I are, are very committed to trying to get that kind of data. But would you think the data will help if we actually can say, here are the top myths about the performance of older workers, and here's actually industry by industry. We've, you know, we've got the business case for diversity, but that business case for diversity does not include a, a component of a business case for keeping older workers in the workforce. A, a few things you said I, I just want to respond to. One, the, the legal experts who I've talked with about age discrimination and the ability to talk with older workers about their plans reliably tell me that, that companies over-respond, that they're too concerned about this. And if you actually look at what's legally uh, permitted, uh, you can have conversations about plans for the future. Um, older people want to have conversations about their plans, older workers, you know, for, for uh, this as well. So there, I think we can get around that. Um, but the other thing you're saying is how, how do we assess the talents and the skills? Again, if you're not, a, if you're not supposed to talk about age, how do you talk about the strengths of older workers? I mean, this is, you know, and, and, it, and it appears that older workers, and if you contrast them with millennials, really do have different kinds of skills, and that when you put them together, that's where you see these productivity increases. So older people are more emotionally stable, uh, better mental health, less concerned about their own personal advancement, and more concerned about companies and colleagues. <laughs> That's a nice quality to have. Younger people come in, their knowledge of, uh, uh, based on, on, on their education is going to be more current. Uh, they are willing to fly anywhere, do anything. I know you'll do this anyway, no matter what. <laughs> but millennials are more, more likely uh, to work 24-7, to do these kinds of things. So we see these differences. You, you, the, when I see, look at the differences and then couple them with some similarities, which really are in values. So millennials and older workers share values about wanting to do meaningful work. They want flexibility. So you start to put all these pieces together. And I, I deeply believe that the employers who say, here's the mix I have. This is the mosaic I've got in front of me. I'm going to turn this into something that you know really uh, sparks, are going to do better than ever because of this new resource that's growing. But we have to be able to talk about it. We have to be able to, to express the concerns we have uh, in the workplace. Uh, we have to be able to identify older workers who aren't doing a good job, right. and uh, on and on. So there's, there's, it, there's so much work we have to do, but the potential here is extraordinary. So, so how do we start? Because we've been having, you know, it feels to me like where we were on gender a decade ago. It really does. And so without that impetus to really drive this change, we could be having this exact same conversation in, in a decade. So I think your analogy with gender is brilliant. I mean, I, I think there is so much in that, and, and that's a really, really great way to think about it because part of the argument for gender was won on the basis that actually more diverse workforces add more value. Right. And you know, whatever mm -hmm. we do here, it's got to hit the bottom line yep. or it's not going to happen. I mean, this is not a charitable <laughs> enterprise we're talking about. This mm -hmm. is something right. about raising productivity. Yeah. Um, and you know, when I talked earlier about the need, I think we need to have a two-way conversation between employer and employee, and it's not just, the onus is not just on the employer. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, Laura, what you're making me think about is, you know, when I had my three children, mm -hmm. and I actually had three children, I think one with the first employer and different employers, and I, you know, they're mm -hmm. very generous. But the truth is that we are terrified of talking to people when they're pregnant. In just the right. same way yeah. that you're mm -hmm. saying we're terrified yeah. of talking to people when they're old. Right. I mean, it's actually quite a similar mm -hmm. issue. Mm -hmm. And there's another aspect that I'd really like to bring out here, which is as a woman with three children, I've had various careers, and I, for a very long time when my children were small, I basically avoided promotion. I mean, I sat on my rock, I had a very good job, and I managed to sit there and I managed to avoid promotion because that was the only way I was going to survive. Now, there's a real danger in mm. corporations that if you sit on your rock and you avoid promotion and you avoid the conversation, you eventually get overlooked. And I was looking a while ago, I read an article about um, the peak earning age for men and the sort of career timetable, and I was astonished to discover, I don't know how many of you know what the peak earning age for men is, mm -hmm. but in Britain it was 42, mm -hmm. right? You know, that's the time when a lot of us are trying to juggle our families as well. 
-hmm. And I think there's a big issue which is particularly relevant to women, but not only to women, about people coming back into the workforce at 50, yeah. you know, people, or people right. wanting to ramp up at right. 50. Right. Mm -hmm. And I wonder how many corporations have got any kind mm. of way of thinking about that, because a lot of those people may find mm. that they've sort of been mentally put on a different track. Mm. Um, you know, and that's not anybody's fault, and we all connive mm. in that, because, you know, like me, for those of us who didn't particularly mm -hmm. want to do the full-time flying around the world thing, um, that was very convenient at the time, but you need to have a rethink. So I think what's so interesting about what you're both saying is, mm -hmm. how do we engineer the rethink? Right. Mm -hmm. And how do we create a moment, where most businesses would really like to do that, I think. Mm -hmm. But all of us, whether we're the employee or the employer, are kind of scared to have the conversation. Mm -hmm. So yesterday we talked a lot about media and about what media can do to actually facilitate either harm or accelerate these conversations. And so let, let's, let's just dig into that because certainly, again, with the gender comparison, one of the most amazing things to see were great organizations like a Unilever or Procter & Gamble make a deep commitment to actually taking the biases out of advertising and, and taking the stereotypes out. Yet we still, the, the stereotypes for older workers in the workforce abound in advertising. Mm -hmm. So I, I know, Laura, you've, you know, you've got a view on this. I mean, if we don't change media, then I think it's very difficult to actually start to see this workforce in a different way. Um, and so love to hear you comment a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, here in Los Angeles is the place to talk about Hollywood, right? right. And its role. I mean, we we need have we, we need new stories uh, about individuals and and about a society that's changing. And I think many of the problems we see in the workplace are are, are represent problems we're also seeing in in lots of domains. And that is that this increase in life expectancy happens so fast that we haven't built a culture that keeps up with it. So we, are, we, we added 30 years of life expectancy in a single century. That's more years than were added across all prior millennia of human evolution combined. In a century, that's what happened. It's no surprise that we humans who are creatures of culture, you know, culture guides us through life. It tells us when we're old, it tells us when we're young, it tells us when to have kids, uh, when to retire, when to come back to work. So that culture is still stuck in one that evolved around lives half as long. Hollywood, media, journalism, that's what's going to change the stories. And we need those uh, to change so that we can begin to be creative and to think about the new opportunities we have. I mean, we're going we're gonna to work millennials, I'm going to say, we'll probably work into their 80s. You know, people who are educated and affluent, they're going to work forever. So if you're, not, if you're going to work forever, why not work better? Let's go to four-day work weeks. Let's take off time when we're having kids, when they're, we're raising kids at home. Uh, find new ways to continue to work super part-time when you have little kids. So you're not complete, you know, we have these all or none models of work. You're in or you're out. And maybe we need lots and lots of flexibility there. But all of these aspects of the culture need to change. How we think about our lives and how we say, where, how do we take extra time 30 years and make the best out of it. Uh, that's what we need to do. And that it's probably a lack of imagination is our biggest problem right now. So, uh, Laura, I, I would agree with everything you just said, but one little minor point. Um, you said millennials are going to work to their 70s or 80s. They may, unless there's an economic reason, let's put that aside for a second, they may not be able to for exactly what we've been talking about for the last. 40 minutes, and that they, just like Generation X and, and boomers today, have to be able to break through that bias, that inherent bias about the older worker. Mm -hmm. So it, this is just as much of an issue for someone who's 65 as it is for someone who's 49 as it is for my daughter who's about to turn 20, who's on the very end of the millennial stage. So. But you see, the boomers, this is going to be our legacy. We're getting rid of this ageism. That's why we're doing this today. <laughs> so then exactly the millennials right. can work forever. <laughs> but there's a very, so I'll share. I think there's a, you know, we're at an inflection point because we've never seen across the globe the focus on the study of work right. and the workforce of the future, right? So if you think about a science that is underinvested in, it's the science and the study of work in the workforce. And so one of the things we believe deeply in 
and Mercer is we can interject this in every conversation about the workforce of the future. So we now study what is the impact of artificial intelligence and AI on this family of jobs? What are the adjacencies? How can you retrain people with these skills? And I think if we insist that you ask, and which of these jobs lend themselves to what cohort of workers? Why can't older workers do this work? You know, great client of mine, BMW, what they've done in their factories and how they've integrated older workers because they've actually seen that those diverse teams have better safety right. records, have better customer satisfaction scores. So that's a really, uh, I mean, let's, we can unpack that a little because we're right at the point where everyone's trying to study work. There are more studies on the future of work, but very few of them talk about the future of work as it relates to older workers. Right, and I think you're right. Today, now is the time because demographics by themselves are going to drive the conversation, maybe slower than we all want, but mm -hmm. in the US, you have 10,000 people a day turning 65 and will continue to do so for yeah. another, whatever, 12 or 13 years. Japan, we all know, is the, is the oldest country on, on the planet. Mm -hmm. Germany has issues. France has issues. Uh, you know, Great Britain has issues. So I, the demographic shift alone is going to, I hope, drive this. We just need to have another impetus behind it to accelerate it. But Camille, you made a really important, a really important point, which is it's not just keeping the workers in the workforce; it's actually bringing more older and more mature men and women back into work. And so, you know, it isn't just the trajectory of of retaining in Japan; it's trying to get the 50 and above women back into the workforce. So, I mean, when you think about that from a policy perspective, you know, and you think about how were you able to influence a, a major policy shift on the sugar tax, what, what, you know, what would you, what, where, where, where do we start on that? Or what would you suggest we, we think about? Okay, well, I mean, I could do the sugar tax because I was in government working for the prime minister, right. so now I'm not. So um, <laughs> I think, look, I think there's clearly an issue about reskilling. But it seems to me that we all know that, but I, I still haven't found anybody who's really cracked it. Mm -hmm. And what does it actually mean? Mm -hmm. And we're all waiting for someone else to do it. And I, I don't think those things come from governments. I think those yeah. things come from business. And I actually think business now has to mm -hmm. take some responsibility just because the bottom line drivers are so fundamental here mm -hmm. to figure out, you know, how do you, what are the skills you are looking for and how can you get some of these people, both in your workforce and outside it, how can you get them up this curve? So I did a lot of work a few years ago with um, very junior nurses and healthcare assistants and people working with old people. I did a report on it for the government many years ago when I was a journalist. I interviewed a lot of, they turned out to be mostly women and they were mostly middle-aged and a lot of them had done really badly at school. And they'd had their kids and then they sort of got back into the health world. And you know what? A lot of those women were really mature and they had a lot of common sense and all the things that we would assume. And they had very few qualifications. And one of the things that I worked on was trying to figure out how could we get them a few more qualifications because the institutions that, had em that employed them, the hospitals and issues, were saying these people are really quite good. Mm -hmm. And actually they're loyal and they're committed and we can get them up the ladder. Now that's just a particular Rescue. example from health, but I, I just think there must be so many of those examples the problem we've got, Pat, is I, none of us are kind of directly mm -hmm. responsible for worrying about that problem. But I guess there must be particular sectors of the yep. economy where it will become an acute issue and where we need, we need companies, because companies are the ones who know what they actually need. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Kismet, from your, you know, when you look at it through the lens of kind of how Pfizer thinks about that preserving that well-being and ensuring that we're, you know, going through these stages um, of making that investment. You know, you certainly, you know, you certainly not only have a voice, but you put your research behind it. Um, you know, your perspective on what what you think, what you observe, we should be doing to both keep our employees well, but to also promote um, breaking down some of the biases about older workers. I'll speak from the healthcare perspective because that's the one that I know best and um, for Pfizer, for pharmaceutical companies, but also just sort of the overall right. system. Um, and I think very simply, what gets paid for is what gets done, right? And so when you look at um, some things that have been successful in Medicare, like non-payment for complications from infections that you get in the hospital mm -hmm. or non-payment for repeat visits back to the hospital within um, you know, a, short, a short amount of time, that has had an impact on 
practice that has had an impact on prevention. Unfortunately, too much what we are willing to pay for is disease, is crisis. We'll pay for a liver transplant, we'll pay for a heart surgery, we'll pay for these catastrophic conditions, and, and actually we continue to, to pay for them, the, the amount of money, the reimbursement rates go up, but we're not really willing to invest in paying for wellness. And I think you could, uh, and you can look at the types of drugs that are getting delivered right now. They are drugs for smaller portions of people. They tend to have tremendous amount of benefit, and there's been a lot of friction about whether or not those drugs will get paid for. And sort of expanding that to the larger issues that we're talking about now, whether it's workforce, and, and I'm gonna keep going back to the population I think we don't talk enough about, which is the lower income, lower skilled older Americans. What can we do to make them and the work they do be valued? I, I've seen in um, New York Medicaid, you can apply to be a paid caregiver um, if you're family or a friend. Right. It's a pretty simple policy change that makes that work be valued. Yeah. We can be putting in safe places for grandparents to take their kids out in their communities to play outdoors. I would imagine if we had a bunch of grandparents outside, we'd probably have safer communities and economic benefit for that. We could be hiring them to work in community centers. So what is it that we can do to make mm -hmm. it economically viable and, and interesting for those adults to be productive in our society? Uh, Bain has a great report out uh, where they're saying there are three major forces we need to address, uh, demographics, automation, and inequality. Mm -hmm. And inequality, when I'm listening to you, I'm thinking mm -hmm. inequality means health problems, yeah. right? I mean, that, that's, that's also what, what, what we're talking about. That's the big, big difference among others. Um, and that is a challenge for the world that we're, we're facing today, and certainly in this country. Um, I uh, was reminded the other day about a conversation I'd read about between Henry Ford and a union boss when Ford was bringing in more automation into the plants. And the, the, Ford says to the union boss, how are you going to unionize those machines? And the boss says to him, how are you going to get those machines to buy your cars? <laughs> and we're headed to that kind of a state where we're going to, if, if, we, if we allow inequality to proceed, if we allow automation to increase inequality further than it has already, uh, then we leave so much of the population behind uh, that we are all going to pay the cost, uh, all of us. And so we, we have to address this challenge. In some ways, I think, Aging, uh, somewhat ironically, may be the force that is going to make us address inequality. You know, look, I, I think, Laura, one of the things that I that certainly keeps me up at night is all of the data around a, the intersection of aging, f the lack of financial well being, and the impact of AI on women, right? So if you really look at the data, it's over the next five years, it's really, it's not five million men, it's five w million women who are going to lose their jobs. And it go, and they're actually women where automation is really going to affect them, whether it's in the call centers, the service centers, operational support. And so I think, because then you've hit, you know, making sure that we don't create a society where you know, not only are we not talking about aging, but we're really not focusing on who are the cohorts of people who are most risk of losing work, you know, and what do we need to do to ensure that we're creating that work? Um, certainly, I. Th think, Scott, some of the research that you do at AARP and how you think about looking at that next, you know, that next set of, of roles and careers is, is actually really important. And so, I mean, I'd love to hear you, you know, just talk a little bit about, you know, if you had one or two things that you think we could be doing, you know, what, what are they? Because we're getting... Wow. Um, so I, I, let me just back up a little sure, bit please. rather than... I'm not sure I could come up with one or two, but I would say that, uh, and we started talking about this before we got on mic, I, I'm, I'm going to be the eternal optimist on the American economy. We have a way uh, in this country of adapting to changes, whether it's uh, going from an agricultural society to an industrial society, whether it's the advent of the internet or AI, whatever the turmoil is, we have a way of recreating new jobs, new industries, new sectors that none of us today can think about, or five years from now may be a completely different story. Think about Amazon 25 years ago, right? Good example. So I, I think there has to be this optimism about our adaptability to be able to deal with artificial intelligence and its impact on society. Um, 
so to answer your question, what are the one or two things I think we, we need to do? I, I still, as it relates to the older worker, I think it's really two issues. It's, it comes back to my opening line about no, I ageism. I also think that companies and organizations and businesses need to recognize the value of the older, let's say, 50 plus population, because I'm going to be biased, that's what we represent, um, and that they have money to spend. Um, that, let's face it, uh, not too many 20 year olds have a lot of money to spend on brand new cars. Uh, so I think by organizations focusing on that market, both from a financial perspective in terms of selling to, their audi to that audience, by hiring that, that audience, um, I think it drives, and it will show, and the numbers will show, it'll drive more productivity, it'll drive a better bottom line, higher share price, et cetera, and it becomes a, a competitive uh, advantage. So I, I think those two points is really the, the keys to it all. Mm. Feel free to disagree with me. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so I, I'm gonna make one slightly controversial point then, um, just for the sake of it, which is, I think we're not going to win this battle mm -hmm. if we pretend that everybody who's old is a brilliant worker. Absolutely. Right? I mean, I think we just need to be really <laughs> clear about this. I mean, there are lots of people that we hire who are 21 who are, who are not great, right? And then they're still not great when they're 59. Okay, so let's not, you know, let's not pretend that somehow that person <laughs> Present company excluded, of course. <laughs> you know what I mean. I, mean just, I, think, I think we've just got to be very careful in, in a very well-meaning mm -hmm. set of conversations mm -hmm. not to imply that somehow there's a sort of epiphany where everyone through the, mm -hmm. the right. glass, you know, at 60 and becomes brilliant. Mm -hmm. um, clearly, companies still need to manage people, and they need to manage some of them out. Yeah. Um, so that, anyway, I'm just going to, I'm just going to say no, that because the way to solve this, yeah. I mean, you've had many brilliant examples on the panel, mm -hmm. but I mean, the way to solve this is to be nuanced about it, mm -hmm. and not to get ourselves into a situation where we're trying to sort of gloss over some of the really de deep issues for people who are managing. Mm -hmm. You know, I completely agree. And, and one of the things we don't have time today to really, you know, unpack is all of the challenges in the global HR processes, right? So, Scott, you and I have had this conversation, you know, from recruitment, from headhunters having biases against bringing older workers in, pay structures, benefit structures, you know, training structures. You know, we are not reinventing the end-to-end, -end, you know, human resource system. We certainly haven't done it for women, and now we're not failing to do it for older workers. And so that's um, one of the comments I'd make for, for organizations in the audience is you have to push. I find that the source of biggest resistance on this conversation is the HR function. Um, so I don't want to get in trouble with my colleagues, but, mm -hmm. but whether it's the kind of conversations you have at the Society of Human Resources, the kind of conversations you have with, with HR professionals, it's almost like they're the most resistant to actually take on some of the biases. So that's, some, uh, that's something I think, Laura, you know, we've talked a lot about is we have to fundamentally transform the whole way we think about life cycle. And you, you were, Scott, talking about that, but it includes reinventing compensation, mm -hmm. reinventing retirement, reinventing you know, the transition in healthcare. Um, and that's a big, big ask. It's a big, big reinvention. So, um, huge, yeah. mm -hmm. so I mean, so maybe Laura, just to you know, end with a few things where where um, we we think hope promise. Um, just a few more words about the kind of work you're doing on the performance of these teams, because um, anyone who's interested, we'd certainly be glad. We're looking for a cohort of some other companies that can actually do this. So I thought it'd be great for you to mm -hmm. just talk a little bit more about that. Sure. Um, right, this is, this is work that's really following um, on the findings from Haig Nalbanchan that I mentioned earlier, uh, who is um, a colleague of, of Pat's and a labor economist at, at Mercer, and finds that a greater density of older workers in a unit increases the productivity at the unit level, even if you don't see that in individual evaluations. Um, in conversations that followed from that, uh, that, that we have been having recently, we've begun to uh, devise uh, plans now are just about to start in one company uh, uh, an experience sampling study of behavior of workers day to day. So we're assuming we know something about what's happening in that dynamic, but to my knowledge there is no behavioral data about it. So what we can do is go in and identify high functioning exceptional teams, compare them to less exceptional teams within uh, an organization 
and examine the age diversity in it, but then get really dig down and say, what are people doing? Are they helping each other? What are, how are they sharing? How are they distributing work? And we're very excited about that kind of work. And, and do also believe, as, as, as you implied, Pat, that it isn't going to be um, uh, one story. No. This is going to be different for different kinds of companies. But we're very excited about being able to, uh, to really figure out what's happening in, within these companies as yeah. a function of age diversity. And I think building on that, one thing um, I certainly know um, Polar Ring is committed to is from a, from a commercial perspective, really starting to frame up those biases, right? Really understanding mm -hmm. what are those biases, whether it's older workers not learning technology, older workers not being um, as agile, and really be building those data sets so we can begin yeah. to say, here are the facts in this industry, in this country, about that cohort. Um, and to re you know to honor, uh, get you started, so I just wanted to um, do my plug for um, Silver to Gold. Um, Paul Irving and the team did an amazing job on um, the business of aging with all of these chapters woven together. Um, and I think it's actually a great start. Um, but if it's all we do is read um, and we don't actually act, we're probably um, not not going to make a lot of progress. So. Um, in the spirit of we'd love, I'm not sure, I feel like we've had a good conversation. I don't know if there's any, um, any questions in the audience or anybody who's actually got a point of view on this um, that would, they would like to share. Um, anybody? Great, that's great. Please, the microphone's up here, it'd be great, thank you. Um, this is also interesting, and I'm just, I'm really curious to know more about inequality in aging um, and how this issue that is already such, um, you know, a beast for our society to tackle is going to change and, I would imagine, expand and grow um, as our lifetimes do. So I can give you an example. It's, um, it's like uh, for someone 50 and over, the time it takes them to find a, a job or you know, replacing a job they have lost is almost double under 50. I, I you know, I think, you know, thankfully I'm in a position where I don't have to worry about that, at least as of today. Um, <laughs> who knows about tomorrow? Um, but I can't tell you how many people that I know, well-educated, um, some Ivy League grads that are in their early 50s have been downsized. And, and this is not a story from eight, 10 years ago. This is a story from, right. you know, today and last year and two years ago that people have been out of work for mm -hmm. uh, a year, two years, still trying to find a job. And you know, two in particular are two of the smartest people I know that I, if I had a spot, I'd hire them without even blinking an eye. But it, there is, and they constantly say to me, there's this perception that you're old and nobody wants you. Mm -hmm. And it's much harder to find a job when you're over 15, you've been unemployed. And the longer you're out, the harder it becomes. It becomes this horrendous uh, self-fulfilling prophecy. So it's difficult, and it's real. Um, and I'm sure you guys have the stats, and I, I bet you there's some in that book, too, that, that, sh that prove out it just takes a lot longer. And once you break you know, a two-year two mark, you're almost completely untouchable. So what do you do when you're 53 years old or 55 years old? And, right. You've been used to a certain standard of living or, or at any level, and all of a sudden you're unemployable. You have to reinvent yourself. It's hard. It's hard. So, um, so in the spirit of we don't want to leave on what's hard, we want to leave on, on um, what's, what's positive, I do think that, that what you heard in the conversation is there are a lot of parallels, in my view, to other, uh, other social issues like gender. I think if we can really take those learnings, but really apply them in a disciplined way through this workforce right. of the future work. But in my, our hope is that you don't forget that cohort as you're doing that work, yeah. right? So, um, so thank my panelists. Thank you for a great conversation and thank, thank the audience. Much. And uh, have, enjoy your last day, so thank you.